Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled Crisis Management, When the Big Case Hits, How to Get Ready and What to Do When the Alarm is Sounded. I'm Courtney Young, an attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenter, Daniel Trainin, thank you for joining us. Daniel is an accomplished litigator who has handled matters across the litigation spectrum throughout the United States during his 20-year legal career. His practice ranges from the defense of entities in mass tort and single claim products liability matters, class actions and insurance coverage matters to employment, transportation, environmental, toxic torts, medical and healthcare litigation, general liability, and commercial litigation disputes. In addition, Daniel has frequently defended individuals and entities in professional liability and security claims, as well as bar ethics complaints. He conducts fraud investigations on behalf of insurers and counsels individuals, entities, and other policyholders on risk management best practices. He is a recurrent speaker and author on many of these topics. Daniel, a former associate and partner at Wilson Elser until 2010 in Chicago and Boston, returned to the firm in 2015 after moving back to his hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. He's licensed to practice law in the state and federal courts of Illinois, Missouri, Georgia, and Massachusetts. With that, I am pleased to turn things over to Daniel, who will begin today's presentation. Most of my practice has been uh, helping companies and individuals respond to lawsuits, so this topic comes naturally to me. Um, I've also been involved in defending mass torts for life sciences companies over the past 10 years. Um, uh, think heparin or pain pumps or knee implants or a certain compounding pharmacy up in New England. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to provide you with some insights into that process as well. Uh, today I'll be discussing a basic outline of initial considerations when your company is sued. Uh, these are really the initial considerations when that lawsuit walks into the door. Some protective considerations to prepare the company for suits before and after they are filed, and I will address in particular spoliation issues uh, and the gathering of resources to litigate a claim and or address the potential for settlement or judgment. Finally, um, I'll discuss some special considerations in the event that your company is dealing with a mass tort. Uh, there are a lot of ways that a company can be put on notice uh, that a loss, lawsuit or a group of lawsuits are, uh, coming in, are coming towards the company. This may include the realization that there are a number of injury complaints that the company has been monitoring in its own trending process, which may come in from doctors or patients about a particular product. Uh, certainly a recall can put your company on notice of a poten of potential litigation. If your company receives letters from attorneys asking the company to put its insurer on notice, which may include a direct lawsuit or demands that the company preserve evidence, this is also an indicator that a lawsuit is likely coming. Sometimes your company will receive a demand letter for money prior to suit. This is an attorney's effort to try to resolve a personal injury dispute without filing a lawsuit. Uh, there are filing fees and pressures of court deadlines uh, and other factors that go into uh, actual litigation when a, when a suit is filed. And so sometimes a, a a plaintiff's attorney and, or a plaintiff will attempt to try to resolve a claim at the, at the demand letter stage. And this is certainly worth considering um, and investigating as doing so could save the company a lot of money in legal fees associated with responding to a lawsuit, depending upon your deductible. And uh, it may also uh, keep a lawsuit out of the public eye, uh, or, or the dispute at least out of the public eye, because once a lawsuit is filed, um, uh, it becomes part of the public record and everybody can see that. A tolling agreement is another mechanism to aid parties in resolving claims pre-suit. Uh, a pressure that is always on the plaintiff's side is the potential for the running of the statute of limitations. And sometimes, uh, in, in some cases, it won't even be clear when the statute is going to run um, because that will be dependent on when a court or jury de de decides the plaintiff first understood that they were injured by, by your company's product. Entering into a tolling agreement, which simply tolls or stops time from ticking on a claim, can relieve that pressure and it allows the parties to try to resolve a dispute pre-suit. If you want to resolve uh, a dispute pre-suit, generally the company will need to get things like medical records which show, the, show an injury and proof that the, that the company's product was in use at the time of the injury. Uh, it, in a pre-suit discussion, you may also ask the claimant to submit to an interview to discuss the injury and its impact on that person's life. 
as well as to learn about potential alternative causes of the injury. Having an, certainly having an experienced attorney to help with, the, with this uh, aspect of the uh, pre-suit investigation is a good idea. And if the claimant is willing to be reasonable pre-suit, entering into a tolling agreement and negotiating a pre-suit demand can lead to an excellent result for a company. Uh, certainly, there is uh, not always an opportunity to resolve a claim pre-suit, and many times the first notice of a claim will be the service of the lawsuit on the company. So a very basic che checklist of things to do when you, you or your company receive that lawsuit would include things like reviewing the lawsuit and considering and understanding the deadlines uh, associated with that filing, notifying your insurer, considering the possibility and availability of other insurance that you might have uh, beyond your, your product liability insurance, making sure that your company is complying with its regulatory requirements, and then finally meeting with outside litigation counsel to uh, come up with a plan as to how you're going to address the lawsuit. This is a very basic checklist, and this checklist is designed to set forth the items that should immediately, that a company should immediately think about when that new lawsuit arrives. You know, I'll be discussing each of these uh, items in the checklist uh, in subsequent slides. Uh, but you should keep in mind that since the lawsuit may be the first notice you have that anyone is seeking money from your company based upon a claimed injury, it may also arrive months or even years after the demands have been made and the lawyers have been involved. So my focus here is the first notice type of lawsuit, but I'll also address the more longstanding claims as well. So the first one was review the lawsuit and consider deadlines. Regardless of the past history, the first and most important consideration when a lawsuit comes in the door is the clock. The clock starts running when your company is served with the lawsuit, not when it's filed. Lawsuits are typically served by a process server and received by a person who is authorized to receive service on behalf of the company. Usually, in order to do business in a state, a company has to identify who is authorized to accept service of lawsuits on behalf of the company in that state. Typically, it will be a person, maybe an officer of the company, if the company is located there. Um, but more likely, for larger companies, uh, it will be a professional company that, where all they do is receive lawsuits. Um, and one such company is called CT Corporation, which uh, probably a lot of your companies use. There may be a lag in t of time between when the person at the company who is really responsible for dealing with the lawsuit, be it corporate counsel or risk manager, and when the lawsuit was actually served. So, uh, service doc and service doc documents should typically identify on them the service date, but it's important to understand and figure out what that date is. Um, and, 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 and also, again, to keep in mind that the service date and the filing date are very different. What may be stamped on the complaint could be the date it was filed, but the date it was served is going to be some date after that. Uh, it could be a day or two after that if, if service is easy, like on a CT corporation situation. Uh, but it may not be. It may be weeks or months later. Um, under the federal rules, you have four months to serve a lawsuit. Uh, under other uh, state clause, uh, state, state requirements are, are different by state. Uh, but that clock does begin to start when the company receives service, and the significance of that date uh, must be communicated. Uh, the, the, that actual date must be communicated with counsel. Um, there is no hard and fast rule on how long you have once you're served. It would depend upon the jurisdiction as well. In federal court, a company has to file a response of pleading um, within 20 days from service. State courts can last from 20 up to 30 days and in some instances it may be longer. If the company fails to respond or file a response within the, within the new date deadline, depending upon the date of service, there is a risk that the company will, def will be defaulted and in essence lose the case right up front. Now courts generally don't like to default defendants and there are often ways to avoid a default, especially if efforts are made to try to cure it. But, there is but this default risk is a risk that your company does not want to uh, to, to face, because once a company is in default, the company is really at the mercy of the court um, to decide how it wants to deal with that default, and uh, in, in some cases setting aside the default 
or finding the default is technical and allowing, allowing the uh, company to plead out of time. Um, but because you're leaving it in the hands of a judge, there is no telling what might happen. The service date also starts the clock ticking to remove a, a state court case to federal court. A defendant has 30 days following service to remove a case to federal court or risk waiving the opportunity to conduct removal. This is a jurisdictional issue, uh, which is whether you have the case tried before a federal judge, who is usually a, a more sophisticated and more impartial judge, or a state court judge, which is often a riskier proposition for a corporate defendant. So long as the defendant is based and incorporated in a separate state than the plaintiff, and the amount at issue is more than $75,000, a case can be removed based upon what's called diversity uh, if it is done within 30 days, i.e. in a timely manner. Uh, as a result, if you can remove a case to federal court, the ability to do so may have huge implications for how the litigation progresses, the costs involved, and even the outcome. So again, it's very important that, and, and again, that removal date is also triggered on by service. So uh, the decision as to whether you're going to remove and whether you are able to remove is something that must be done quickly within 30 days of service to avoid losing this important opportunity. After uh, determining the service date, the next step is to notify your insurer. This is necessary to get your defense paid for by the insurance company, which I'm sure everybody wants to have happen. Uh, in order to notify your insurer, you have to understand the nature of the lawsuit because you will be expected to provide to the insurer the facts and circumstances of the claim. This includes a copy of the lawsuit and the, comp and the company's knowledge of the issues that are raised in the lawsuit. Uh, this is typically done in a notice of claim form, and the specific requirements are set forth in your policies. In order to get coverage for a lawsuit or other claim, you must provide notice to, again, uh, the, the insurance company. Um, on the MedMark form, I should say the MedMark form contains a very standard um, uh, notice provision which you see on most claims made policies. Uh, by way of background, a claims made policy covers claims that are first made during the policy period. So if the policy period is from January 1, 2018 to January 1, 2019, the policy covers claims that are made during that period, regardless of when, when, whether the injury occurred or the events that led the injury to occur um, uh, occurred at an earlier point in time. And of course, coverage is always subject to the other terms, conditions, and exclusions in the policy. Um, as an aside, I should point out that some policies, or many policies, have a retroactive date, which does put an earlier limitation on when the loss could occur as well. Those are usually found in the opening section of the policy, which identifies the limits, deductible, policy period, et cetera, uh, or by endorsement attached to the policy. If you have questions about a policy's retroactive date, you should talk to your broker. So uh, the date of the claim is critical uh, to the insurer, as you, and it is critical that you report the claim to the insurer as soon as possible. You should note that, in, uh, that the definition of claim in most policies, including the MedMark policy, isn't just the filing of a lawsuit. A lawsuit isn't, isn't the only way that, um, isn't the only thing that is a claim. Uh, although a lawsuit is a claim, a claim is generally any demand for money or services. So the demand letters that we were talking about are also claims that have to be reported, and the failure to report such claims could ha also have an adverse uh, consequence for further coverage of a lawsuit that may, be, that may be filed in a subsequent policy period. So it's important to, have, to put your insurer on notice of these claims as they may be able to help you avoid the filing of a lawsuit uh, by uh, hiring counsel even at the demand letter stage to help you resolve this claim before suit saving you and the insurer money and aggravation that we talked about. Uh, the MedMark policy also contains a number of conditions requiring the assistance and cooperation of the insured. The reason for this is that the insurer has the responsibility for and control over the defense of the litigation, and so your company uh, has to help the insurer, um, and you do that by providing the relevant documents. Uh, depending upon the claims made in the lawsuit, the company can also consider whether uh, notice should be given on other policies uh, that, that uh, you may have. This is uh, particularly the case 
when there are lawsuits which make allegations against individuals at the company or which seek damages against individuals at the company. These may trigger uh, the company's other insurance, like uh, errors and omissions uh, insurance or directors and officers insurance. Um, the company may also have a, what's called a CGL or comprehensive general liability policy, and that may provide coverage for some claims as well. Uh, it's worthwhile to have a coverage lawyer take a look at the policies or at your policies, or at the very least discuss the issue with your broker when the lawsuit comes in. Uh, those policies, like the MedMark policy, will have deadlines to give notice of claims, and if you don't trigger the coverage by making a claim at the beginning of the process, you may find out later on, if you want coverage from those policies, that it's not available because you haven't complied with the terms of the policy. For this reason, consideration of other insurance is very important following the initial service of the lawsuit. As you know, uh, when customer complaints come into the company, uh, this may all, often trigger federal reporting obligations. Uh, many times those reporting obligations have a quick turnaround, uh, 15 or 30 days. Customer complaints typically come into the company through particular avenues, and they're addressed by the regulatory department or group in your company very efficiently. However, when a lawsuit comes in, it may not be picked up by the regulatory group that handles customer complaints and reports. Uh, so when a lawsuit comes in, there should be a mechanism within the company uh, to make sure that reporting obligations are met as the lawsuit should be treated like a customer complaint, particularly if it is the first notice of the company, not necessarily of a lawsuit, but of, of any type of complaint, which it, it, it often could be. Uh, so, and for purposes of the litigation, it may be important that the reports on the, you know, the MDR um, or any other regulatory reporting you might have are accurate, accurately and properly made um, as those report, as your regulatory reporting in a particular case will be evidence uh, that could be used in the litigation. Uh, with keeping that in mind, um, it's always a good idea to have outside counsel be involved in reviewing uh, an MDR or other reporting uh, before it is made before the report is made to the FDA, if that is possible. The last uh, significant event immediately following the company's receipt of the lawsuit is to meet with outside counsel. That meeting should be uh, preceded by the gathering of documents and information about the claim and the provision of that information to counsel so, it can, so you can have a productive meeting with your lawyer. Given the short time frames on removal and filing a response of pleading, it is important to meet with counsel as soon as possible. During that meeting, an initial strategy will have to be developed. You will have to consider things like, how strong is the claim? How bad might the damages of the claim be? Is this a one-time problem or are you expecting more claims? Who else is involved? Meaning other companies. Uh, are there any problems with your insurance coverage? From these questions, you may have to decide as an initial matter is this a case that you want to fight? Is it a case that you want to settle? Or in most cases, is this a case where you just need more information and you'll have to pump that decision down the road until you get that information? If litigation is the result, um, you should work with counsel to figure out, how, out a strategy for how the case will ultimately be resolved. And the case should be handled with that, reservation, with that resolution in mind. Finally, issues like preservation of evidence will have to be discussed at this initial meeting. Now that we've discussed some of the things that happen when a lawsuit comes in, I want to take a step back in time and talk about a system that your company can set up ahead of time and then move forward and, and talk about how, what, what the things your company can do once litigation has begun. Some of the protective considerations uh, that you can take prior to and after the filing of a lawsuit include setting up a response team, incorporating counsel into your investigation of an occurrence, uh, either before or after the lawsuit is filed, avoiding spoliation of evidence, looking for risk transfer opportunities, and involving marketing or, or public relations uh, groups in your uh, firm or outside uh, who can help you uh, with any reputational issues that can arise from a big lawsuit. Not only do these protective considerations address uh, 
protecting the company from future suits, they also reflect strategies for protecting the company from discovery problems after litigation has begun. So let's first talk about the response team. Um, this is something that can be set up ahead of time. Um, you can set it up tomorrow if you want. It would be useful to the company in the event that uh, when litigation is filed, that team will be the one that will take action, starting with the issues raised in the previous slides, including assessing the complaint, giving notice to the insurer, uh, meeting with counsel, addressing regulatory reporting, and of course, marking that date when your response of pleading is due, having a, a team in place who could even look at that and make sure that the, that the dates, the deadlines are not blown in the litigation right off the, the bat is, is, is a huge uh, uh, thing for that response team to do. Uh, having an in-house attorney involved or in charge of this group is a good idea as it may provide an opportunity to shield this group's activities from discovery by opposing counsel. Without a group or person designated to respond to lawsuits, it is easy to see that some of these activities may not happen, and certainly not at the speed at which they really need to happen in order to make sure that the company is fully protected. Uh, if you don't have an inside legal department, associating with a, an attorney outside of the company at the outset can also be useful. That attorney can help you set up an appropriate response team and provide crucial preliminary legal advice regarding occurrences or even claims uh, before the insurance company gets involved. Uh, it is possible, uh, even likely, that a quality investigation has taken place regarding the issue raised in the complaint, particularly if there was a customer complaint that was made before you get notice of the lawsuit or even of a demand letter. Uh, if there was no customer complaint uh, from this particular customer, a review should be undertaken to see whether the issue in the lawsuit has been raised or complained about previously uh, by other individuals. This information, actual complaints and other complaints, should be prepared for outside counsel's review as it will have a direct impact on the initial strategies involved in handling the lawsuit. If the company has started an investigation or an investigation is, is in process, it should be temporarily suspended so that outside counsel can become involved at the earliest possible time. Once litigation is initiated, all information relating to the investigation should flow through legal counsel. This is the way to protect the investigative process from future discovery by opposing counsel. A significant issue in litigation over the past 10 to 15 years has become the issue of spoliation of evidence. Uh, and, and this is particularly by defendants following the filing of a lawsuit. But it can also um, uh, occur uh, when evidence has been spoliated uh, even after, you know, before a lawsuit has been filed, but, but after preservation letters are sent or demand letters are sent. Spoliation basically means the destruction of evidence, uh, usually without the intent. Well, well, this is usually without the intent to affect the, the outcome of litigation. Um, whether it was intentional or not, this can create substantial problems for defendants when it happens. Uh, typically, you see it happen in three areas, the destruction of products, the destruction of paper documents, and the loss of electronic information. So what is, what is that issue? Um, in federal litigation, and really this is mirrored in state courts as well, uh, parties are responsible for uh, providing in discovery all documents, electro electronically stored information called ESI, and tangible things for which, uh, which for our purposes could, is usually like product samples um, or uh, reserve batches, that kind of thing, that may be used to support claims or defenses. The scope of documents and other things that must be produced are those that either are either relevant to the case or which may be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of relevant evidence. Um, this is very broad, and so the company should have the expectation that if litigation is filed, it will have broad obligations to produce documents and other information in that litigation. Uh, this part of the discussion is designed to give you some idea of the company's responsibilities in that regard. Let's start with products. So for products, it is important that the company, or the response team, hopefully, uh, make certain following 
the filing of a lawsuit or the receipt of a demand letter or preservation of evidence letter, that samples of products involved are segregated and stored and kept from destruction. If particular lot numbers are identified either in the lawsuit or in the original customer complaint that was made prior to the filing of the lawsuit, special attention should be taken to segregate and store samples from that particular lot or batch. Recalls involving products uh, make this particularly important since the FDA often requires destruction of products that are recalled. When a recall takes place, there should be a focus on recalled batches, um, uh, which are batches complained about in customer reports and those identified in litigation. Remember, even though you may have only one or two lawsuits, if there is a recall, you should anticipate further lawsuits uh, in making decisions about what to save. So documents. Um, when litigation hits, or if you think it's about to come, uh, the company should start collecting documents as well. In most cases, document retention policies that companies have provide a significant cushion before destruction. However, litigation sometimes happens years after events and certainly after products are developed, designed, and manufactured. So it is important to immediately begin to collect and preserve paper documents following the filing of litigation. A court will not look kindly on a on regular destruction of paper documents that are or could be relevant when the company is on notice that the litigation has been filed. Now, certainly if you destroy paper documents but you've saved them electronically, then you're still covered. Uh, what I'm talking about is paper documents that have no electronic backup. Uh, the types of documents that should be considered are varied, including batch production records and process testing records, uh, inspection records, and really any record involved in the manufacturing of the product, if a particularly if a manufacturing defect is going to be alleged. Sales records and distribution records, which may have an impact on questions of product identification, for example, whether the company delivered products to the treatment facility where the plaintiff was treated and, and, and claims, uh, and from which the cla he claims an injury. Um, documents associated with the incorporation of other products into your product, for example, like uh, the incorporation of heparin into a flush syringe. Design files, complaint records, regulatory records all have to be addressed as well and may be relevant depending upon the particular allegations in a lawsuit. Uh, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Um, when considering avoiding spoliation of ESI, you have to consider where ESI might be found. This includes emails um, and metadata about the emails, word processing documents and metadata associated with Word, word documents, calendars of uh, relevant people um, who may be relevant to the litigation is what I mean by relevant people. Uh, voicemail messages uh, via telephone systems, and also potentially electronically stored voicemail messages, text messages, images, videos, photographs, um, information contained on company-issued devices and smartphones. Uh, pr preservation of all this evidence has to be considered in order to avoid potential spoliation. Uh, well, so that, was the that was the slide I just did. I'm got uh, confused here. Um, going back to the prior slide, electronic discovery uh, or ESI is, is, means any information stored in the electronic medium. Uh, it does not include uh, actual substantive data like content of email messages, um, uh, but it includes both the email content of the messages and also the metadata. Metadata includes information about drafts that were created, uh, changes to the documents, the time when documents were created, um, and those sorts of things. Uh, so it's really information about the document. So that's the electronically stored information. These are the, these are the uh, locations where it can be found. Um, and uh, this is what you need to do when, with respect to electronically stored information. Uh, the, the typical way that spoliation is addressed for ESI documents and uh, products is through a uh, litigation hold letter or memo, um, which, which are transmitted throughout the company, usually by the response team or the company's in-house counsel. Uh, it is generally a good idea to have a plan in place to transmit such memos each time new litigation is filed. 
If there was ever a question about whether the company took action to preserve evidence, the first thing that a court will ask is whether a litigation hold memo was circulated. The failure to do so will be strong evidence of company neglect if spoliation does occur. The response team should address this issue as soon as possible in conjunction with outside counsel, including foremost who should be recipients of the hold letters. The content of a litigation hold is pretty standard. Uh, you want to make sure that there is uh, that it's it's clear that the hold supersedes all other retention or destruction policies. Uh, it should explain what the litigation is about in in neutral terms, because again, the litigation hold letter is something that's likely going to be produced to the other side. You definitely want to avoid making any liability admissions in such a memo. Litigation hold letters or memos should identify on it who is supposed to receive the memo. This will obviously be determined, at least in part, by what the litigation is about, who would be the most likely custodians of evidence. Uh, the memo will have to be uh, tailored to address the specific records likely to be relevant. However, the documents um, we've already discussed are likely to be on that list. It should address products, uh, paper documents, and devices and other mediums through which electronically stored information might be found. Uh, it might extend to personal devices or computers of company employees to the extent that the company work is performed on someone's personal, personal devices or computers. The memo should be created to allow for recipients to acknowledge receipt of the memo and copies should be retained by the response team in a control folder so that, you, that this is um, a document you, you have. These memos are both an opportunity for the company to preserve evidence, but they're also a way to cover the company in case something goes wrong. Uh, if you don't have copies of the signed memos when you need them, uh, then you've lost a substantial reason for having those litigation holds in the first place. Um, so let's say you send in a litigation hold to uh, uh, management person X and they blow it off. They sign it and then they, they blow it off. Um, the company um, you know, may face some problems in, you know, in a discovery sanction as a result of that, but if the company shows that it, it, it made an effort to get that information and, and preserve it, uh, that will help uh, in the course of litigation if spoliation occurs. If spoliation does occur, the penalties can be substantial, including uh, fines by the court, uh, loss of defenses in the lawsuit. Uh, it can be it can lead to the imposition of what's called an, an adverse inference. An adverse inference is when the jury is basically told to accept as true a negative fact about the company. <clears throat> so. You know, in other words, if spoliation does occur, the outcome of the case could be impacted. Uh, the penalties do depend upon the degree of culpability. If the company makes a strong effort to preserve evidence using litigation holds and a proactive approach, uh, including the use of a response team, and somebody makes a mistake, a court is less likely to be harsh in penalizing the company. If the court finds that the company was lax in or even intentionally culpable, then the results can be really severe. Another protective consideration is to look to others for the cause of the injury or lawsuit. Uh, this is called a risk transfer. You want to, if you can, and if it's appropriate, to transfer the risk or responsibility for the lawsuit to someone else, if, if that's, if that, again, if it's available. Um, and uh, you know, can you point to an internal reason for the loss, or is there an external reason uh, uh, to the company on which the company can blame the injury or the claim. For example, did somebody supply a uh, uh, defective part to your uh, product, which was incorporated into your product? Um, did somebody who was a consultant to your uh, firm provide a service which turned out to lead to the defect in your product, which caused the injury? Um, are, you, are you working with a contract manufacturer? Um, each of these things, each of these others, uh, external to your company, if they're at fault um, for the reason why the plaintiff was allegedly injured, um, they could be a, a source of your risk transfer opportunity. Um, in other words, if there's a component part to a device which was manufactured or designed by someone else, they might be the real culprit, in which case you may be able to um, if your contractual language is correct um, or otherwise, 
um, <clears throat> excuse me, bring them into a, a lawsuit or have them take over the defense of, your, of the lawsuit for your company. Um, so the, the question you have to ask is, um, uh, do you have an agreement with the supplier or manufacturer or consultant which has indemnity language um, or hold harmless language that will allow you to have them protect you in the event of a lawsuit? Um, if you do, uh, such an agreement may also require that that person have liability insurance in place which protects the company, that company, in the event that the service providers or contractors or manufacturers make mistakes and the company is sued. Um, as an aside, the company, when working with these types of contractors, manufacturers, or consultants, should strongly consider incorporating indemnity and hold harmless agreements in their, in their agreements with these uh, third parties. Um, with such, uh, and, and, that the, uh, and that those indemnity and hold harmless agreements be backstopped by insurance, i.e., that they make your company an additional insured under their policies. Um, now obviously, if their mistakes cause your company to be sued, um, your company is going to be pretty unhappy to bear that cost itself, including the cost of a likely, uh, uh, paying the likely substantial deductible in your policy and the cost of future premium hikes if your own, if the company's own claims history is adversely affected by, by a lawsuit. Assuming such agreements are in place, as soon as your company gets sued, your response team should look at that and find out what obligations these other entities owe your company. So what is indemnity? Indemnity is like insurance. It is a situation in which another company promises to pay a judgment or a settlement if your company is held liable, typically a result, as a result of the other company's negligence. A hold harmless obligation uh, is even broader. It is a promise not only to pay a judgment or settlement, but also typically to defend your company in the event that a lawsuit is filed against the company, again, usually arising out of the negligence of the other company who has this obligation. No obligation is usually triggered until and unless your company puts the person with the obligation on notice of the claim. So you need to make a demand for indemnity in writing as soon as possible, identifying the lawsuit and the contract provision which the indemnity obligation was made. Now, this can be done by your, by your company or it can be done by outside counsel, but outside counsel has to be made aware of these agreements and the situation uh, so that this can be done as, as quickly as possible. The demand for indemnity should include a request for insurance policies that the company has to support its indemnity or hold a harmless obligation. If your company is an additional insured under this policy held by the manufacturer, supplier, or consultant, it is important that your company provide notice of the lawsuit to this other insurer, just as you've done with your own insurers. It's not enough that you demand indemnity from the contractor or supplier. Notice to them is not going to be notice to their insurer, or at least it's not going to be notice to their insurer that you expect coverage under their insurance policy. Um, even if the contractor supplier claims that they have no obligation to you, uh, that does not necessarily let their insurer off the hook. The insurer's obligation might even be broader than the contractor or supplier's obligation. So getting that additional insurer on notice is very important. As everywhere else, the clock is ticking, so notice should be provided as soon as possible to this other insurer as well. Getting this additional uh, insurance involved helps for several reasons. It's very important for your company. First, it, will, it can preserve your own policy for other claims. If someone else's policy is handling a lawsuit um, and your policy isn't, um, your policy is, is basically preserved. It provides extra money in case you need it for this claim. So what typically happens is the other policy would go first and then your policy would, would, would in, essence, in essence be excess. So if the additional insurance that you get through this indemnity provision in your contract with your consultant provides you with a million dollars of insurance, and you have a million dollars of insurance through Medmark, this effectively gives you $2 million of insurance. Um, the other insurance may also provide you with uh, coverage below your own deductible amount. So if you have a $100,000 deductible with Medmark, 
um, you're paying out of pocket the first $100,000 that the lawsuit comes in. If this other insurance company doesn't have a deductible on their policy uh, and they owe you an obligation to provide you with insurance, you can get dollar one paid by that other policy. Finally, um, your, your cooperation uh, requirements with MedMark may require it. So again, this is going to be information you're going to want to share with MedMark in any event. And an often overlooked aspect of defending life sciences companies is to consider that the companies the, is to consider that the company's public face when a lawsuit or group or, or a group of lawsuits come in the door may be impacted. Uh, that public face is is typically reflected in the company's marketing department. The people marketing the product are going to keep on doing that regardless of the fact that the lawsuits have been filed unless you have to take the product off the market for sure, for some reason. So you want to make sure that the marketing is not saying anything that can negatively impact the litigation. Um, you also want to have the litigation have as small an impact on your company's ability to market its product. So as you can see, there's going to be a tension between these two goals. Um, and that tension, the tension between um, effectively marketing your product, uh, but also reducing an impact that marketing might have on litigation is something that's going to have to be addressed through the company's response team. One way to do this, to do this is to have a public relations firm at the ready when, in the event that a mass tort or significant litigation arises. The PR firm can help your company with shaping its public image, notwithstanding the significant litigation, um, uh, which certainly can tarnish a company's interest, particularly with a group that may be your company's most important target, physicians and hospitals. You know, when lawsuits start flying, um, it's, it's your it's your, it's your clients, physicians and hospitals, that are going to start hearing about it and they're going to start asking questions, particularly of the marketing people who they deal with. Having a public response uh, created, a public relations response created in conjunction with litigation counsel, so that obviously you don't want the PR firm to get crosswise with your litigation message, can help a company survive the reputational impact that can be created by significant litigation. You also, of course, want to involve your marketing department in the litigation strategy. The goal is to avoid public statements via marketing that are not consistent with the company's litigation positions. If they are inconsistent, this can have dire consequences in the litigation, especially when it comes to the company's own credibility. Life sciences companies market in a variety of ways, including the use of brochures, having representatives in operating rooms. Uh, they do so via presentations at scientific conferences, and, and, and certainly with, uh, in, in correspondence with doctors. The consistent message is key, and that's why involving outside counsel in the marketing function can make sense, and it is important, as I said, to the defense of the company in any event. Finally, I want to address a few thoughts to circumstances when a life science company is faced with mass tort litigation. A mass tort is when, due to a problem with a product line or an alleged problem with a product line, or a lot, or a batch, or even just a large number of complaints um, or injuries, a number of claims arise. Uh, this will often happen in conjunction with a recall, but not always, um, and especially if we're talking about a warnings type case instead of a design or manufacturing defect type case. We've all seen TV commercials where plaintiff's law firms are, are trying to generate plaintiffs uh, inspiring them to call phone numbers like 1-800-BAD-DRUG or some similar, or go to some similar website. The lawsuits can be in the hundreds or in the thousands, and when this occurs, many of the items we have discussed become magnified. So when a mass tort arises, uh, the press will become active and controlling publicity um, uh, via the company's message becomes a paramount concern. As discussed, the company will want to speak with one voice and the message will need to be controlled. Uh, and this is accomplished by both engaging a public relations firm and by having uh, outside counsel involved with marketing. Failure to control the message uh, risks news articles quoting company sources that are not controlled and can or will be used against the company in the litigation. Uh, so controlling publicity and even employee use of social media is an important step when a mass tort occurs. 
foliation protection becomes all the more important as well because the size of the case or cases will magnify the uh, evidence if it's missing. In a one-off case, lost evidence might not, might not even be noticed or realized as the resources going into the case uh, or a single case would be controlled. Uh, all that goes out the window in a mass tort where everything will be scrutinized by lots of different plaintiff's firms. So the company must be hyper vigilant about preserving evidence when it first learns that multiple lawsuits are being filed arising out of a particular event. When 50 or 200 or 2,000 lawsuits are filed, they're not filed in one or even a few jurisdictions usually. They are usually filed everywhere. The company will want outside counsel with experience as national coordinating counsel to be involved. A one-off or single event case, as discussed above, will be assigned to a lawyer who handles such cases in the area where the lawsuit was filed. But when the lawsuits are filed all over the place, you need a lawyer or really a team of lawyers to coordinate the defense nationally or even internationally, um, which sometimes occurs. The goal of such coordination is to have a consistent company position across the board, raising consistent defenses and addressing discovery in a particular consistent way. Did I say consistent enough? Um, without coordinating counsel, the defense will degenerate into chaos as there will be no agreement or common responses to many issues that arise in the litigation. Having all those lawyers coming to the company and asking for the same thing over and over again, if you've got different counsel all over the country, will also drive the response team crazy. Uh, coordinating counsel uh, resolves all these things, creating efficiencies. A, a major consideration when mass torts are filed is whether to consolidate the lawsuits into multi-district litigation. Multi-district litigation, or what is known as an MDL, is a process where a single court is charged with addressing all the lawsuits arising out of a particular event. Even though the cases are filed everywhere, when an MDL is established, all the cases from all over the, well, at least the federal cases from all over the country, are transferred into one court before one judge who makes all the pretrial decisions. Uh, there are a lot of convenience factors in, in doing this. A single judge running discovery as opposed to 50 or 200 judges uh, making different discovery decisions and different scope of discovery, permitting different scopes of discovery, et cetera, um, and, and, and certainly with the, the significant prospect of inconsistent decisions among the judges uh, will drive up the cost of litigating these cases uh, dramatically. Uh, an MDL will typically be accompanied by a bellwether trial process where the parties select a handful of representative cases to prepare for trial, and then they try those cases to try to determine the value of the cases. This is done to begin a settlement process uh, where the cases are categorized and evaluated for, for settlement, uh, ultimately with the effect of shrinking the portfolio of MDL cases through a settlement process. Of course, if the defense wins uh, these bellwether trials, then you know, a, a lot of times the MDL will just fizzle and, uh, and, and the cases will just get dismissed. Um, the MDL is usually the most efficient approach to mass tort litigation. Uh, certainly, there are much higher stakes in finding insurance coverage. I've talked about the process, but if uh, the company is facing dozens or hundreds of lawsuits, um, then it will want to have as much insurance behind it as possible uh, in order to address these cases. Uh, other more dire issues also come to the fore with a mass tort, including the potential for bankruptcy, particularly if liability in these cases seems certain. If deaths are involved, and there, there, then there could also be the possibility of criminal prosecutions, and these obviously can affect the civil defense, as individuals facing criminal prosecution are going to need criminal defense attorneys, and their concerns certainly will be more focused on avoiding criminal liability rather than worrying about the company's civil liability. Obviously, a mass tort is a very big deal for any life sciences company, and there are many other considerations which are beyond the scope of today's talk. Uh, I certainly hope that you don't face a lawsuit. However, life sciences companies are certainly targets for lawsuits. Uh, it seems like most of the product liability suits that are filed are directed at life sciences companies. So being prepared is a really good and prudent business practice. Um, now happy to answer any questions. All right, so we'll now begin the Q&A session. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A panel located at the bottom right of your screen. After typing your question in the space, hit provide and hit the send button. Please be sure to direct your question to all panelists in the ask menu. Um, all right, and we had a couple come in throughout your presentation. So first, Daniel, when a new claim comes in, is there a way to tell if this is just a one-off claim or if you've got yourself a mass tort coming? You could never know for certain 
Uh, but typically, you'll know when a mass tort is coming um, because it will be usually re you know, preceded by a recall or a series of customer complaints about the same type of issue. Uh, certainly, if a, if a plaintiff's bar gets a hold of a warnings issue, um, it may not be immediately clear. For example, um, we represented a, a series of cases involving a warnings on a heparin label, and the allegation was that the, the warnings uh, were insufficient to warn about a particular um, side effect from the use of heparin called HIT. Um, uh, but it was, uh, and so they, they, they came in even though there wasn't really a, um, uh, a, a group of customer complaints and there was certainly no reason to recall or even change the level, the, uh, the label. Um, this was a situation where we were able to get summary judgment on, the, on behalf of the client in a few cases and then the rest of the cases just kind of fizzled away. Um, uh, and the summary judgment was, was, was based upon the fact that, you know, every doctor who uses heparin was aware of this side effect. Um, and so they were, the, the warnings were, were good enough for the doctors. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question, how does involving an attorney, whether it's your in-house counsel or an outside attorney, how does that prevent disclosure of the company's investigation? So, uh, when the company, um, uh, runs, well, when an attorney is involved in any aspect of an investigation and that attorney is providing legal advice and the attorney's uh, legal advice or anything related to that legal advice is going to be protected by the attorney-client privilege. So that's one way it gets shielded. Another way is if the, um, if the uh, uh, investigation comes at a, at a point in which the company is aware of the, of the probability of litigation coming, so it's investigating in response to the, the, the probability that a lawsuit will be filed or certainly after a lawsuit has been filed, there is what's known as the, work, the attorney work product doctrine. That doctrine um, protects the mental impressions of, of an attorney. So, is, if, so the involvement of the attorney in communicating as part of the response team, there, that person's mental impressions will also be protected or will also be used to protect uh, the content of that investigation. Okay, thanks. So just to re reiterate then that it's, your involvement of your in-house counsel is sufficient to, um, I guess, enact that, that protection, that privilege. It should be, yes. Um, but, well, both privileges, really, the attorney-client privileges and the work product privilege. Um, the, the goal of the work product privilege is um, uh, your opposing counsel shouldn't be able to conduct discovery and learn about the mental impressions of opposing counsel, whether they're in-house or, um, or uh, litigation counsel, um, through, through discovery. Uh, it, uh, you, you shouldn't be able to use discovery that way. Now, there, there are um, exceptions to the work, to the, uh, work product. Um, certainly, if, if the impressions don't involve uh, litigation or if uh, the, uh, the investigation or the content of the investigation is such that um, uh, there's no other way to learn, not about the investigation itself, but facts that would be important for the plaintiff um, the work product privilege can be overcome through uh, a, a what's called a substantial need uh, exception. Got it. Thank you. Well, that's actually all the questions we have, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. Daniel, thanks so much for another great presentation. I think this is such crucial information for life sciences companies.